All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to Path of the Paleontologist. We are here today to help all of you discover your Path of the Paleontologist. And today we are, and at this panel, we are starting our Path of the Collections. Some people call them the Keeper of Bones. If you are organized and have an eye for detail, perhaps a collections manager is the job for you. With me today, I'm joined by four amazing collections paleontologists, and I'm really excited to kind of talk about what it means to be a collections manager, kind of the importance, the most important position in a museum, if you ask me. Um, I'm not biased at all, <laughs> but I'm really excited to talk more about collections. So why don't all of you kind of introduce yourselves to our audience? Let's start with you, Bailey. What's up, YouTube? <laughs> no. Uh, my name is Bailey. I work at the ALF Museum of Paleontology as a senior collections assistant. It's my technical title. All right. Uh, Dr. Jen Bauer, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jen Bauer. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a invertebrate paleontology collection manager at the University of Michigan Museum of Paleontology. Thank you. Dr. Mariana Di Giacomo, how about you? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mariana Di Giacomo, and I am actually no longer a collections manager, but I still work with collections. I'm a natural history conservator at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, Lindsay Walker. I'm Lindsay, and I am the collections manager of Invertebrate Pan paleontology at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, which is a mouthful. <laughs> well, welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's get started with the panel and kind of talking about your stories. You know, how did you end up in collections and working in collections? Because a lot of people think about paleontology as like research and dinosaurs and things like that. But this is a very, very important, I mean, not even joking, this is a very important aspect of museum paleontology. Um, so how did you get in there? Let's start with you, Bailey. Well, collections people are obviously the best. You'll see that today for sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I got, I don't know, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> I came into collections very um, strangely. I don't know, is this the background part? <laughs> yeah, tell us your story. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I didn't ever care about paleontology. That's that's rough to say. I didn't. It's not that I didn't care about paleontology. I didn't know about paleontology. It wasn't on my radar. Um, I graduated high school. I didn't go to college right away. Um, I was working as a housekeeper for most of my for so many years, and when I finally went to school, um, I just went to like a local, semi-local religious college studying English. Um, had a, a bit of a life crisis <laughs> about that and left. Uh, that got a small scholarship and a very large bank loan to do a semester at sea program. So I went and um, that was my first time really spending time on the ocean. Uh, I'm from Montana originally, so landlocked. And anyway, then I was on the ocean and... When I came back from that, I also I didn't go back to school immediately right away. Just kept working, trying to find a way to pay to go back to school. After that, didn't have like a degree or anything yet, and finally decided to take out a bunch more loans to start go back to MSU, my local college, where I studied archaeology through their archaeology program. Because I, well, it wasn't even archaeology to start with; it was like anthropology. Because I was like, the human condition is confusing to me right now as this like conflicted young adult. And so I started in that. And within that program, I found that archaeology was like the coolest part. I was like, this is so interesting and so cool. But in typical undergraduate fashion, I wasted my time <laughs> and my money and I didn't get super good grades, didn't do any field work, um, that sort of thing. And so when I graduated, I was like, I need um, just to go back to work. I don't have time to do this archaeology like field school thing to get a job in the field. Anyway, and I found a job working on uh, historical sailing vessels. Uh, so working on those and preserving, helping preserve those. And I worked at a couple different organizations. First on the East Coast, um, landed a job there as an assistant cook on a ship and fell in love and worked my way up and did that on the East Coast for a bit. 
and then transferred to the Los Angeles Maritime Institute in LA. And that was my first time moving to California. Um, but I was going broke. <laughs> I had mismanaged my finances up until that point. I couldn't, I could no longer keep up this position, which didn't pay very well. I went back to housekeeping for a little bit and was totally miserable. And then I was trying to find another job. And um, I knew by now Gabe and Jared and Andy at the museum, they're like, we need a tour guide, like come to our museum and be a tour guide. And I was like, yes, I can do that. I want to get back into like archaeology stuff. Like paleo is not that different, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway, it is very different. But I didn't really, I honestly really didn't know much. Like the Jared, the first time um, we met, he asked me what my favorite dinosaur was. And I said it was a pterodactyl, <laughs> which was like, <laughs> everyone was like, no, get out. <laughs> we don't want you here. <laughs> but, but I learned and I was there at the museum and I was like, this is cool. And I was doing tours all the time. And then I started being like, hey, Gabe, do you need help in collections? Like, hey, Gabe, do you mind if I do this? And there was all these projects and Gabe was so busy with all this hourly stuff. And I was like, well, do you want me to do that? And it was like, I, I just kept taking jobs from him and kept asking people to do things and kept like taking on more projects than I probably should have. And um, yeah, one thing led to another. Now I'm a collect. I work in the collections room as a collections professional at the Paleontology Museum, and it's been great. And I know a lot more about fossils and things than I ever did before. <laughs> Long <laughs> Thanks, story. <Bailey>. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's a great story. Again, a very unique path into paleontology. So, Jen, how about you? What's your story? Did you start on a ship too? <laughs> I did not start on a ship, but similar to Bailey, I kind of lacked um, drive in undergraduate in my undergraduate career. So I was um, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I knew I loved ecology and the natural world. So I was like, I'll just major in biology and you know see what happens, and I'll get a job in a lab or some something would work out. So my senior senior year, so like the last semester I was there, I took an elective, which was intro to paleo, because it was a, you know, an upper level elective, I was just trying to fill a course requirement. And I didn't really have plans for after graduation. So a couple days into the course, I fell in love, I was like, there's so many cool things about ancient life, I had no idea that that was a possible career path. So I asked my professor, uh, Dr. Roy Plotnick, uh, how do I become like you? How do I become a paleontologist? And he essentially offered me a job on the spot to work in his lab, which was very fortunate. So I stayed for an extra year and I got a minor in, there wasn't really a geology program as earth and environmental studies. So I stayed there and took some of the intro courses and he helped kind of guide me through applying to graduate school because I really was interested in pursuing paleontology as a, a career. So I ended up going to Ohio University for my master's degree. Um, oh, but I should also add that I did not have very good grades, similar to Bailey. At the end of my undergraduate program, um, I had difficulty adjusting the first couple years. Um, and yeah, it took like the entire next three and a half, four years to really get my grades back, back up. Um, but I managed to, to get into a one graduate program uh, with Dr. Alicia Stigall in, at Ohio University, where I kind of looked at um, ancient brachiopods and how they were related to one another. And I started getting really interested in how things like fit into the overall tree of life and what we could use those things for to answer kind of big questions, like how do things move around through time? Can we use them as indicators for environments? Um, so I have a very kind of big research background so I wanted to continue doing that. Um, and Alicia actually gave me the first opportunity to help manage a collection. She had about 15,000 specimens from the Cincinnati region of Ohio, which is an excellent, excellent area to go fossil collecting. There's so many great specimens, especially brachiopods. Um, and so I was helping kind of get her project online. So the collection was in pretty good shape when I got there, but we wanted to make sure that everybody had access to it. So we created kind of like an online um, digital atlas for, for the fossils in her specimens, in her cabinet. So that would be the Ordovician Atlas. If anyone's interested, there's a whole bunch of atlases online. They're really great to explore. Um, so that was also my first kind of dive into big scale outreach, which is another thing I'm really, really passionate about is making sure 
like I'm doing this research, it's kind of hard for people to understand, but it's important that everybody understands why we do it. Otherwise, I don't really see a point in, in pursuing it. Um, so then I decided that I was really, really into um, using fossils as a tool to ask difficult evolutionary questions. So, um, and all of my work has been specimen based. So I've always been working in museum collections, uh, but it's hard to find people to, you know, talk to about it as a potential career path because everybody kind of pushes, oh, you'll be a great faculty member at a university. And I'm like, well, I don't really know what I want to do. But right now I know that I want to keep researching. So I went on for my PhD at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville uh, to work with Dr. Colin Sumrall. So I have now switched clades. I was a brachiopodologist, as Alicia says. Um, and then I started working on ancient echinoderms. So things that look kind of like little acorns or rosebuds, they're called blastoids. Um, they're very near and dear to my heart. I spent a long time looking at them and thinking about their shape and why they look like that and what that could mean about how they've changed through time and other important questions we could ask about them. Um, and then at the end of my PhD, I realized that I didn't like teaching. Um, I actually hated it. Um, not that I didn't love interacting with students. I think that was my favorite part, but I, I go full gas, 100% into everything that I do. So then I had no energy to do anything else. And I really loved doing research. I liked being in the collections. I liked doing outreach. So I was like, I need to find something that, that fits me a little bit better. Um, so then I went on to a postdoc at the Florida Museum. And I did a lot of museum education work and museum outreach. And then I realized, okay, this is, I think I belong in a museum. <laughs> so I started to more actively apply for jobs in, in collections. And I was very fortunate that the University of Michigan was hiring um, and I sort of made the trek from Florida to Michigan and now I care for two million invertebrate specimens which is really excellent. I get to be with them all day and every time you open a drawer it's a new adventure and I also have time for outreach so I get to interact with the public. We have a really active fossil club um, and fossil clubs have been a part of my graduate work for a decade so having access to people who really care about fossils and don't necessarily have like the formal research training, but know where to go. They have the time, the expertise. Um, it's really great to be able to interact with them on a very regular basis. And they then form, you know, your volunteer program. So they get to help you in the collection as well. So I guess that's also kind of a long winded story, but a little bit different from Bailey. So I think we've got a really good panel here today. Definitely. Great story. Mariana, what's your story? Well, my story began when I was like seven and Jurassic Park was everywhere and there was all this merchandising everywhere. And um, my grandmother got these magazines for my brother because dinosaurs, I guess, were for boys. So um, he was too young to read. He didn't know how to read yet, but I did. So I started reading them. And so one day I went to my mom and I said, Mom, when I grow up, I'm going to be a paleontologist. And she was like, what? A what now? <laughs> so it started like that. I just wanted to be a paleontologist. That's what I wanted to do. And um, I did my undergrad and my master's. And so my undergrad in Uruguay, things are a little different. Um, I went to uh, biology, but you have to kind of choose your major like right away. The first year, there's no turning back. Uh, now the program is a little different, but um, so I started biology and on the last year, you kind of choose like a major within that major type of situation. That's when I chose paleontology. And then I did my master's in uh, zoology, also focused in paleontology. So I was working very on like academia, uh, working with um, mathematical models to uh, understand uh, ecological um, relationships between mammals from the Pleistocene. So I, I was doing all of that. And in 2011, there was this opportunity to go dig at a site that um, had been you know, for bureaucratic reasons, not, uh, we could not access the place, but in 2011 we could. And so that was one of the most amazing fieldwork experience that I've ever had in my life. 
Um, this place is called Arroyo del Vizcaíno. It's uh, close to Montevideo, the capital city, but it's not right there. And logistically, it's a nightmare because uh, the bones, it's a bone bed that is under a stream. So you have to dam the water, pump it out, put all the fish in buckets and throw them to the other side because you don't want them to die. So it's it's very complicated. And as I was working on that, I could see the fossils changing in front of my eyes. I could see things going on like oxidation. So they were changing color from this bright orange sometimes to this dark brown in a half hour. Or they were drying out too quickly and they were cracking. And so I started asking myself questions about how do I take care of these fossils. And then I got a job as preparator, collections manager, outreach person, all of the above in this tiny collection that we was started because of the site. So now the site is, um, is a collection as well. It has around 2000 fossils that were taken out and there's thousands and thousands still to uh, take out because this bone bed is amazing. And again, working there, I was struggling with uh, what materials should I use? And and just asking myself a bunch of questions about how to preserve these fossils. And that's when I decided to do a PhD in preservation studies at the University of Delaware. So I came to the U.S. and that's what I did. And um, I did research on conservation of fossils. And also during my uh, time at University of Delaware, I was fortunate to get a fellowship in the conservation department at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where I spent three years and just doing, you know, my research, but also other things on conservation of all natural history collections in general. And once I finished my PhD, I also was very fortunate that at that time, um, the Yale Peabody was in search for a conservator. And so I applied to, to that job and, and was very fortunate to get it. And here I am today. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Those are such great stories. Unfortunately, it looks like Lindsay is having some technical issues at the moment. So we will um, come back to... Oh, wait, hold on. Nope. Still having some technical issues. So we'll come back to Lindsay in a second. Um, for now, how about we talk about what exactly it means to work in museum collections? Um, all of us have very different jobs. All of us wear very many different hats. So how about we go around and just kind of talk about like what it is that you do as a collections person. Uh, Mariana, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so before when I was a collections manager, my job was to exactly manage the collection and, you know, catalog and, and all of those things that I'm guessing um, will be told by others. So I'm going to talk about my role as a conservator in the collection, which is taking care of those collections um, from a different point of view. So what I do is mostly preventive conservation, which is what do we need to do to preserve these uh fossils working with what is what are called the 10 agents of deterioration. So light, uh, humidity levels, temperature, there are all these agents that cause harm to collections. And so um, in the in the realm of fossils, I work with collections managers and with the preparators as well with both what is the preventive measures that we can do to avoid any harm and also with looking for um, archival materials and other methods that we can do for example if the preparators need to use certain adhesives and, and other materials i'm lucky to work with a team that is very conservation focused in that sense but we're always discussing oh which adhesive should we use or which materials uh, or where, where can I get them which is also a conversation that sometimes is not it's not as easy but essentially and now for example that we're undergo we, you know this renovation that the Yale Peabody Museum is going through um, my tasks are monitoring anything and everything in the museum so that during this renovation all the things that are left in place um, are fine. Uh, with things like vibrations, we have vibration monitors and, and, and other things like that, just taking care of, of all the specimens while we undergo this renovation. Awesome. How exciting. What a really cool project, too, to be working in a museum like the Yale during a renovation. Uh, Jen, how about you? What is it that you do as a collections person? 
Um, so as, as you said, Gabe, I wear a lot of hats. Um, so I do a lot of different tasks. The main one is to take care of the specimens. Um, we have a nice new collection space. Um, but sometimes we need to, you know, upgrade boxes to make sure they're archival or they need to have different kind of packaging. A lot of um, old, old specimens are stored in things like matchbooks and old tins that, you know, are not things that will last forever. So we want to make sure that they're stored in a way that they will be preserved in perpetuity. Um, I also take care of loans. So researchers, we're a research museum, so we don't have um, display. We loan specimens to be put on display to our sister uh, museum. Um, so I take care of people borrowing specimens or they're returning specimens or some of our researchers want to borrow specimens. All of that kind of paperwork comes through me. Um, I also help our Natural History Museum if they're having exhibits. I help, you know, curate text or get them specimens that could go on display, um, help with um, kind of logistical things on that end. Um, I also do a little bit of research myself, and I also manage students. Uh, we have a lot of digitization projects going on right now. So in addition to all the physical specimens, we have lots of digital specimens and digital specimen records, which need to be, you know, um, conserved in their own kind of way. So um, I like to think of myself as, you know, a collection manager, a uh, conservator, an archivist, a librarian, and a registrar kind of all packaged into one one person. So we also have paper archives. So when people publish on our material, or we have lots of historical records like field notebooks, all of that's also stored in our space. And then we're kind of actively creating lots of new digital records on a very rapid basis. Awesome. And it looks like Lindsay is back. Lindsay, are you back with us now? I am. I apologize. I'm a little wiggly looking because I'm on my phone, but I'm trying That's okay. to hold it steady. <laughs> I'm really glad you're able to join us again. Um, right now, we're just talking about what you do as a collections manager. Uh, we'll hear from Bailey, and then we'll come back to you so you can tell us your story, all right? Cool. Well, I'm glad you're able to make it back, and thank goodness for phones, right? <laughs> That's technology. All right, Bailey, what do you do at the ALF Museum Collections? Great question. Um, <laughs> all sorts of things, I guess, similar to everyone. Um, I think the trait of mine that benefits me the most in the collections work is like obsessive, like organization kinds of things, because that's been a big thing um, for us. We have a very small collection space in, a his in like a very old historic building. And so a lot of what I'm doing is making sure items or specimens are properly housed in like the right archival materials and protected against like uh, earthquakes, things like that in California, especially, um, but doing so in a very limited space. And so being very um, meticulous and organized to keep it all sort of in order the way it's supposed to be organized through time uh, in the space that we have, which I like to admit that I'm good at. I think despite the limited space, we're doing very good. We're doing great. Our specimens are taken well care of and are where they should be, which is fun. Um, so a lot of that is obviously like um, cataloging to keep track of it all, um, mounting things that need to be mounted um, or cavity mounts, I guess, more so than like mounting, but like storage mounts um, and that kind of thing. And it's, starting a little bit to learn more about like the conservation stuff like Mariana was talking about, which is super interesting and super awesome to me. Um, I was, well, we have a lot of um, work that's gone into our museum, but even before I got there to get all of our stuff up to like archival standards and stuff that Gabe really um, pushed for and Andy. Um, so I'm lucky in that regard to learn a lot from them and to go through all the old collections and replace it all, make sure it's all archival and then to um, help a little bit with like volunteers and stuff that come in who need projects to, for like labeling and cataloging and stuff like that. So yeah, pretty, pretty, uh, same as everybody, <laughs> pretty like a lot of different <laughs> stuff all in the collections. And it's great. Cause I look at different cool fossils every day, which feels special. So, oh yeah, we get good Instagram fodder when you work in collections. <laughs> oh Yeah. <laughs> I'm no good at uh, posting about it, but I'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lindsay, let's get back to you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be back and join us. Um, why don't you tell us your story and then tell us a little bit about what you do as a collections person at the NHM, NHMLA Invertebrate Collection. 
Okay. And I apologize. Leaf blowers just showed up at my house. So hopefully you cannot hear those. Um, <laughs> of course, perfect timing. Um, so I actually might move away from this window <laughs> because they're right next to it. So I um, started in geology as well. So I should reverse. I didn't actually start in geology. So I originally, when I started college, so I did go straight from high school to college, but I didn't know really what I wanted to do at the time. So I originally wanted to do historic preservation and architecture. So I had like all my classes planned out and I was like really excited about that. I went to a school that specifically had a program for that. Um, but you know, when, when you're an undergrad, one of the things they often make you do at liberal arts schools is take classes in all different disciplines. And so I was like, great, let's get science out of the way right away so that I don't have to deal with this anymore. And I took geology. And then, of course, I really liked it. Um, and so for a while, I was like not sure which I didn't think I had enough time to really like double major. So I, I ended up um, working in a micro paleo lab um, as like when I was a freshman, like my first week, one of my professors was like, does anybody have room for like an extra credit? And I for whatever reason, raised my hand. <laughs> I don't even know what inspired me to. Um, and I ended up working in that lab pretty much the whole time I was an undergrad. So it was like, you know, it was micro paleo. So we would like go out and get cores. So I, this was near like the Chesapeake Bay near Washington, D.C. So we would get like sediment cores and I would wash the samples. I prepare the samples. Then I ended up doing like some of my undergrad research on that. So it was sort of like an introduction into paleo in that sense. But um, you know, I still really wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my degree or like professionally. I, you know, like many people did not know collections was a profession. Um, it took me a long time to figure that out. And, um, you know, when I was in that program, because we were near DC, we did take a few field trips to the Smithsonian, which kind of started to open my eyes to like, oh, collections are a thing. <laughs> this is a thing I maybe might be interested in. So that happened a couple times. Um, and then for the end of my undergrad experience, you know, you start like thinking about like, what am I going to do next? <laughs> um, and I ended up applying for an internship in Colorado and I, I got it. And I, you know, it was like a leap of faith. And it was the kind of thing when I look back on it, I'm really glad I did it because I, I wouldn't say I was the most adventurous individual, like an undergrad. And so moving all the way across the country at the time was like, a little bit out there for me um but you know at, at the time it was only supposed to be for 12 weeks so I was like okay you know 12 weeks whatever I can do that um but then I ended up basically not leaving because I liked it so much <laughs> and so I was with the park service I worked at Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument um for a little over a year and while I was there I was helping them do it was more outreach actually than collections work I they, it, I just happened to be there, there at the year that they were building a new visitor center and the park had been waiting for a visitor center for decades. So I got to help, you know, kind of be one of the coordinators and organize some of the content for the exhibit. So for individuals who are um, watching and aren't familiar with Florissant, it's not micro paleo. It's like mostly it's fossil redwoods, fossil plants, fossil insects. It's a little bit different than what I was working on in undergrad. Um, and that's really where I kind of decided, okay, this is something that I'm really interested in. So I, I started in sort of the outreach sector and that's kind of how I started thinking about like, okay, I, maybe I should go to grad school for this. So while I was there, I learned about the graduate program at the University of Colorado, which has a museum program that's focused on, it, it's really natural history and in museums and they have like a public side and a collection side. So I entered the program thinking I was gonna do education originally. But while I was there, you know, I also took classes in collections and I decided maybe that was actually more for me. So while I was in the program, like my path started just like when I started undergrad, it wasn't like a straight and narrow. I kind of figured it out as I went and I ended up, I ended up on the collection side of the program. So it took me a year longer than I originally had planned to be there, but I worked in um, Dina Smith's lab and she is a paleoentomologist. So I ended up working on fossil insects from the Green River Formation. And a big part of that project, which really helped shape my career today, was they were one of the very first institutions to get um, uh, a big digitization grant to digitize big parts of the collection. So it was called the Fossil Insect Collaborative. And so I was funded on that as a grad student. And so ever since then, it, it's sort of like when I look back on it now, that was around 2013 when, when they got the funding for that project. And everything 
everything digitization seemed so fresh and new and we were like on the forefront of figuring out how to you know take pictures of things and you know going on almost not quite 10 years later it's like we've come such a long way but that was really where I really started to like get into collections because it was part of my graduate assistantship there and um really solidified like the path that I started to go down so I was at CU for about three years and one of the things I it was like part of it was like a requirement of the program but yeah I also wanted to do this too I did multiple internships while I was in grad school and that really helped me figure out like okay do I want to do education do I want to do collections and even though I ended up going into collections I will say that I'm really glad that I did do some of the education internships I did because part of the job as you've probably heard people talk about is it's not just you know sitting behind the cabinets and like labeling because you still have to be able to communicate you still you know a lot of the things that I learned in those internships, I can still transfer to what I'm doing in collection. So I was at the university. So I guess long story short, I was at the University of Colorado for a while. I did an internship at the Burke Museum doing summer camps. Um, I was at the American Museum for a summer. Going back to Micropaleo again, that was kind of a cool throwback. Um, that was another like, you know, moving out of the comfort zone type experience. So I'd never lived in a big city before. I'd always lived in like pretty small towns or like, you know, college towns. And then I got this position in New York and I was like, Am I going to move to New York City? It was kind of like, kind of a scary thing at the time, but I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. And it turns out sometimes the greatest risks have the greatest rewards too. And it was, it was a really good learning experience all around, both in the collections and just like, you know, pushing the comfort zone and learning like, I can do this. I can take the subway to work every day. And it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I got through it and it was a wonderful experience. Um, and so after that, I ended up at the University of Utah for a year, and it wasn't in paleo collections. I was a digitization technician for the herbarium and for entomology, which even though it wasn't paleo specifically, I still really value the experience that I gained there because it's, you know, if you're going into collections, it always helps to learn how other collections do things. Like, even though they're not working with rocks and they don't have to worry about stratigraphy and, you know, chronostrat, biostrat, lithostrat, <laughs> You know, there are methods that they use that you can apply to what you're using, what you're doing in your paleo collection. So kind of that was only for about a year. And then um, I moved to Los Angeles and started at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County in 2016. And so I first started out here as um, like a curatorial assistant, just assisting with a digitization project that was going on and kind of moved up eventually to assistant collections manager and Part of that was because when I first got here, I helped write a grant that got funded. Um, so we decided to join the Fossil Insight Collaborative that I was working on at CU. It's kind of funny. I, you know, when I left CU, I never thought I was going to come back to that project. And then it came back around <laughs> a couple of years later and I joined the tail end of it. And so that was kind of cool to be able to um, hop back on that project before it finished. So I was able to apply those skills again. And then after that, I, I also worked on, while I was an assistant collection manager, another digitization project. Um, it was more folk, it was completely different than anything I'd worked on before. It was Cretaceous of California. So I got to learn a lot about um, identifying Cretaceous snails and bivalves and other marine invertebrates, which I really enjoyed. Um, it's Cretaceous of California is not, not, super, not as thoroughly studied as other parts, other areas of the country that have Cretaceous rocks and fossils. Um, the Pacific Slope is, there are a few individuals who have worked on it, but not nearly as intensely as like the Western interior. So it was kind of cool. There are a lot of undescribed species in our collection that I felt very lucky to be able to be the first person to be like, oh, that is new. That is really cool. <laughs> um, so, you know, fast forward a few more years and now I'm the collections manager. I applied for that a few years ago. It worked out. I'm still here and still digitizing many things <laughs> every day, all the time. It's a never ending task. We estimate it'll take about 20 years probably more realistically to digitize our whole collection. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> Patience is definitely the name of the game when it comes to collections management, right? Um, yes. <laughs> I think moving on to the next discussion, let's, there are a lot of folks out there who may not realize some of the realities of working in a museum, right? Temporary positions, finding grants to fund positions, you know, figuring out pay, advocating, for you know getting full time and things like that for all of you and your experiences what is something that you would like people to understand and realize before coming into this field of working in museum collections i 
I think I can I can start with the international student perspective. So then we can focus on on something else. But um, in, in my case, um, I always had to have funding um, that was associated with my university so that I could do this because um, otherwise um, it would be a problem with my visa and all of that. So finding positions sometimes is is, is hard and complicated um, if you're not a from the US, you cannot take federal positions sometimes. So I, I had a lot of struggles with, I saw all these amazing internships for the summer and all these national parks that I could never take up. <laughs> um, so you have you know less possibilities, um, but there are a lot of, of internships and, and fellowships out there. What is important for people to know is that you're going to have to move a lot. You're going to have to uh, be able to do those things, to just pack up and leave for one year or maybe for a summer only. So the, the path, the initial path into collections is, is a path that will take you to all these different places. And so I think it's important for people to understand that um, you may have to move a lot and that means resources for you to do that and and trying to to have those resources somehow you know either negotiating or um, finding extra money here and there pockets that you didn't even know existed so i think that's that's a big one I could hop on really quick. Um, so in addition to like funding and finances being a huge thing, I agree moving is also a big thing as well. Um, asking questions like how how is the position funded when you are at like the interview stage or you're applying for jobs, it's it's a little bit awkward, but it's really important because that's your livelihood. And some, some positions are con like contractual. So it'll be like an annual renewal of a contract Maybe the position is funded by donations. Um, I'm really fortunate. My line is through the college, so I don't have to, to worry about, um, you know, re-signing a contract every year because it's not dependent on the amount of donations that I received that year. But I think collections specifically were hit really hard at the start of the pandemic, and a lot of people really had to let their staff go because there was no income for a really long time. So um, one of the things that we do um, at our museum is we tried to – to pay all the students that work for us. I know that um, sometimes that's not always possible. We have kind of a small budget, but we do make an effort to, to be equitable in that way because you don't know, um, like I needed that money when I was a student working in a, in a research lab. And um, you do, like I spent a lot of time below the poverty line when I was a grad student and moving on that budget is very, very difficult, but it is doable. And it really just depends on, on what you want. And I think Bailey touched on this earlier, like a big theme was like perseverance and, and persistence. And you, you can get to where you want to go. It just might be a little bit of a bumpy, bumpy road. Yeah, I can jump in to talk a little bit about museums and like our museums not associated with a college campus at all. So that does sort of change, I think, the dynamic quite a bit with funding and positions and things. Um, we are on the campus of a high school, so we do have to kind of go through them a little bit, but we're not, um, but being not university affiliated does definitely change some things. Um, and I think they talked about this in the curator panel earlier too, where it's like it, the world of paleontology is changing, where before if you were a paleontologist, you were a curator or a professor, and that was pretty much it. And now it's expanded so much as a field to include preparing and collections like the curator doesn't just do that all anymore and it's a more open field I guess for that reason um, for better or worse and I think in a lot of ways that there's growing pains associated with that and a lot of the problems that I have and come across in our collection are from part-time staff or interns and they weren't they were would start a project and then never finished or they weren't really properly trained before being assigned a project and mistakes would inevitably be made and i know this happens in a lot of institutions and that is unfair i think to the institution at large and also to the people that come after because for a museum i think the most important thing that a museum can invest in is staff to make sure that everything is properly cared for and nothing is sort of half done and that kind of thing. But it's a slow transition, I think, away from 
an older sort of method towards being like, we can provide proper care with personnel from this. And personnel is obviously the most expensive part about running an institution. So there's a lot of self-advocacy. I think someone mentioned that um, earlier where you find, find yourself in a museum or at least um, I guess my way of doing this, it's not going to be wild, widely applicable, but find an institution and find your niche in that institution and then kind of fight for that for yourself a little bit, kind of, and be like, we need to keep, or we need to do this because the specimens need this or the collection needs this. And a lot of that is going to involve uh, advocating for yourself and advocating for your collection and hopefully getting other people on your side. Um, but it's definitely to come into the field, I guess, at a time such as this, when people are just barely starting to be like, yes, you're right, we need more collections staff, and they need to be full time to prevent these mistakes, um, can be rough. And I think uh, it's something that together <laughs> can be improved upon as like moving forward as institutions. It's something that uh, hopefully will just keep getting better and better. But Lindsay, did you want to add anything? I do. I apologize too. I keep moving around. There's a lot of loud stuff happening in my yard right now. So I'm kind of running away from it in circles. Um, yeah, I have to, I totally agree with everything everyone said so far. And something I'll add um, to kind of like what Bailey's talking about with personnel. So something that they don't really teach you or tell you about in school, even if you go to school specifically for collections management, you see it, but you don't really take classes on it. It's just like, managing people is a big part of the job and a lot of the training you get with that is on the job <laughs> it's really something you can only get like by doing it and that I think if if that is something you know that's always a good skill to have coming into the field and you may get it from somewhere else and don't underestimate like that experience from somewhere else because a lot of us who maybe if you came into it from a more traditional route would not have that skill but if say you know, you're getting into paleo later on, or you have management skills, like definitely like play that up when you're applying, because I think that's really important. And um, it will, it'll go a long way because like, for example, in our collection, normally when we're not during a pandemic, we have, you know, in, in a given week, like up to 10 volunteers, and then they have research assistants coming in and then visitors. And it's a lot of people to manage. And then our collection is also, hey, Montat, that offsite. So we don't have like, the added benefit of other staff, like all the, you know, around all the time. So sometimes it could just be me. And so being able to work through like conflicts and, you know, disagreements that, that those skills can really come in handy. So that's not something you like learn in your paleontology classes, but it is a big part of the job and actually one of the biggest parts and not necessarily one that like they will teach you <laughs> in school. You just have to like do it. <laughs> Jen, you, you had typed something in the chat. Was... Yeah, I was just, I, I completely agree with Lindsay. I learned how to manage people when I was working at a gym in my undergraduate. I was one of the like part-time student managers. So that was like how I got my people managing and mitigating conflict kind of experience. So that comes to our question and answer section. That's a great segue because one of the first questions we have is from Jurassic Ash, who's asking, what do you think are some important interdisciplinary paths and classes to take if one plans to go into collections? Now, for collections, you know, Lindsay said there's class, but there aren't a lot of like programs that are specifically about working in museum collections. A lot of the skills that we learn are things we learn on the job or in other places that we apply here. So for all of you, like, what are some of the important skills and paths and things that you can tell people to take if they want to work in museum collections? Um, I guess I'll jump in and say, well, I think the biggest thing would be, um, I don't know, so much applies, like so much of it can be interdisciplinary, you know, it could be anything. And honestly, it kind of at the end of the day is the collection is a part of the museum in a way like you're going to be sort of involved in pretty much everything that happens in the museum at least adjacent because you're the one with the specimen so they have to go through you to do basically anything else um so like people skills like people were saying and um just the uh, uh the 
uh, being like being interested in the collections part of it and being interested in being the keeper of these bones is part of it because you can enter a museum through a thousand routes um but then uh just interest in the specimens i don't think that's fully answering the question <laughs> but <laughs> there's like pretty much anything goes i guess that's <laughs> like what i'm saying but not really trying to say it. but there's a lot of ways to be interdisciplinary because you do everything in a, some sort of adjacent way which i think is fun and it's really cool and you can be involved in display and preparing and people will ask your opinion about identifications because you deal and interface with a lot of specimens um so Go ahead, Lindsay. I, I would say something that I didn't take any formal classes in, but I wish that I had, or if they had like a library program at my university, they didn't, but data management and like bioinformatics are really important skills that aren't necessarily things like you might learn how to use R, for example, in a research class, but how to manage your data, like what is metadata? Like how do you conform your your uh, database to the standards that are accepted in the field. Like those are things I've mostly learned on the job, but it would have also been helpful if um, I maybe taken some computer science classes that would have helped me learn how to use like things like open or find clean up data, um, you know, things like that. That's just something that I, you know, it's on my radar that I would have to like manage collections data in a database, but I hadn't, hadn't really thought about it from that angle. Um, likewise, like programming skills can be helpful if say you have a database that you can actually manipulate yourself. We do not, but I know in other institutions that is true. So computer science skills, you wouldn't necessarily think would come in handy as a paleontologist or collections manager, but they can be very useful. Databasing is dope. <laughs> I think also, um, I mean, there are a lot of museum studies programs out there. Uh, but finding a good museum studies program that would allow you to do natural history, I think it's important as well if you want to do natural history collections, whether it's paleo or something else, because a lot of uh, museum studies programs are more geared towards art or historic uh, preservation and things like that. So finding a museum studies program um, or a university that allows you to do both things, like if you want to do uh, biology or geology or something like that, and also take some museum studies classes, that would be fantastic. And the other thing that I think is very useful is knowledge of photography. You need to know how to take photos and not just whether they're blurry or not. You need to, you know, take off the, the auto function and go into the manual one and actually do photography. So I think photography is also a, a good skill to have. I'll just add uh, one thing. So I think uh, my training has largely been from the research side of things, but um, a lot of institutions I think are looking for people who have that specific expertise. So I think like my knowledge of specific knowledge of brachiopods and echinoderms really came into handy when I was applying for this job, because if I open a drawer, you know, I can identify almost all of the specimens in the drawer with no issue. So when people are looking for stuff, it's, it's a lot easier for me to go ahead and do that. Um, whereas somebody who maybe had a formal museum studies training or maybe didn't have that really um, scientific knowledge about the specimens would have a lot harder of a time kind of picking through the, you know, 700 cabinets and 6,000 drawers looking for something very specific. So I think it also really depends on, on the track you want to take. So if you're interested in research, don't rule it out, but make sure that you still get that museum experience in, in some way or another. Anatomy was a big one for me, um, just like going into paleo, not knowing much about paleo at large, but having like a, a relatively solid foundation of at least human and um, some um, mammal anatomy was incredibly helpful just in terms of being able to catalog or answer questions as they came up. I want to second that as well, because um, so I, I had my, my career in biology, so I took classes of entomology and invertebrate zoology and vertebrates. So I, I took a bunch of class, botany, everything. And so um, I think now being a conservator, we do things that are called condition reports in which you analyze a uh, specimen and you look at it and you talk about the materials that are, it, are in it, which sometimes is you know, just skin and bones, but sometimes it's taxidermy. So it may have other materials as well. Um, but if I want to also point out the things that maybe need repair, you know, it, 
I need to repair, you know, digit number two, or a, so I talk about anatomy in my reports all the time. And so knowing about anatomy is very, very useful. Yeah, those are all really great pieces to like the puzzle for being a collections person, right? One thing that I'll add, because for those of you who might not know, I'm also a collections person. <laughs> this was my original position at the Alf Museum before I started doing more outreach stuff. But kind of for both sides, you know, something that will help any resume is the ability to communicate science effectively. So if you can find a, a way to practice science communication, learn science communication, you know, there are many different ways. You can do it on social media, you can do it live streaming, you can participate in events, but anywhere that you can practice and develop your science communication skills will help any kind of resume, um, whether you're going into collections, conservatorship, or even a curator or whatever, because at some point, <laughs> I'm going to tell you now, no matter what job you take in paleontology, you're going to be answering people's questions, you're going to be at an event, you're going to be maybe giving a tour, but at some point, some second grader is going to come up to you and ask you about a Spinosaurus, and you better know how to answer that question at some degree. <laughs> um Let's see. Here's another great question. This is actually a combination of two questions from Jared oh, and Philip Kraminski. Hey, Philip. Um, what is your most favorite specimen? And what is the weirdest specimen you have found working in your museum collections? Asking the hard questions now. I'll start with weirdest. Um, <laughs> I'd have to think about coolest. I don't know. But there's this one drawer in uh, the mesozoic section of our collections room and i was just going through it one day and i opened it and it was this like decorative box with like a highly carved lid and like felt lining and i was like this looks cursed in every way it's so cursed and we opened it up and i don't even re remember what was inside of it it was just the most random like bone i think it was i don't even know if you could fully tell it was bone and uh anyway i think I think we have spirits <laughs> because of that box. So I guess that's the weirdest one because it's a cursed object. So that's when the computer started acting up, right, Bailey? <laughs> and the lights were like flickering. I keep seeing yeah. things out of the corner of my eye. So. <laughs> I think answering the question of what your favorite collection or favorite specimen is, it's always the hardest one. And I always like choke up and I'm like, eh, I love them all equally, which is true. Um, but I think, <laughs> I, w I think of it often in terms of like my favorite collection within the collection, um, as opposed to like one, you know, individual object, although there are some that are really cool. Um, we have not just because I'm biased because I worked on fossil insects in grad school, but we have a very cool fossil insect collection here at the at the Los Angeles County Natural Museum. Um, we have a really interesting collection from Germany, and the insects are preserved. A lot of these are available online if you search for the Stotz, S-T-A-T-Z collection. Pictures will come up. They're very well preserved um, insects from the Oligocene, so they're about 24 million years old, and the collection has a cool story. So I think that might be my favorite. Lindsay did the um, behind the scenes tour for like one of the fossil events. And I was always kind of like, ha, oh, like Lindsay does like insects, like kind of nerdy, whatever. And then she's like doing this tour of all the insects. And I was like, holy crap, Like those are so cool. It blew my mind. So I apologize for ever thinking ill of insects because it was a uh, it was awesome. It was truly cool. They're the underdogs, I think. <laughs> I could go next. Um, so we have uh, a lot of specimens, and I think I advocate the most for our Devonian ostracod specimens. So ostracods are kind of like, uh, they're related to crustaceans, so shrimpy-like things, but they have two shells, and the shrimp is in the two shells. And they're very tiny sometimes. Um, the ones in the Ordovician, so like 450 million years ago, are the size of kidney beans, so quite large. Uh, but we have a gigantic collection of Middle Devonian ostracods. And there's so many, and they're so cute, and nobody wants to study them. Um, so please, if you're interested in studying ostracods, I am here for you, and I have lots of things for you to study. Um, and I think the weirdest specimens, um, this might be of interest to Mariana, 
Uh, we have a lot of specimens that are puritized, which means the original shell material was replaced with pyrite or fool's gold. Uh, but fool's gold is uh, kind of temperamental. So we have to keep the room at a specific temperature and humidity so that it doesn't essentially grow like a fungus. Um, and we have a lot of specimens that have, have pyrite disease, which is what we call it. And it kind of just looks like they're kind of moldy. Um, and it's, it's something that you have to be preventative about. So you need to make sure that they're in dry conditions. You need to make sure that if they have the disease, they are repackaged or you try to do some treatment on them. Uh, but it's, it's a weird thing because you don't often think about um, fossils having diseases like after the fact, <laughs> um, but it's something that we have to think about. I really like that, definitely. Um, pirate disease is, is such an awful thing because if you don't take care of it, the bones will become dust. So it's, it's very scary. Um, so I started working at Yale, uh, before the pandemic, but not too long before. So I haven't had the chance to peruse a lot of the collections. Um, I've had interactions with a lot of specimens that are not fossils because of, of the deinstallation of the galleries. Um, so I'm going to talk about my favorite specimen that is actually from Uruguay, which is a Smilodon, which is a saber tooth cat. And the South American one is larger than the North American one. And I worked on a fang that I did treatment on that it was in many, many pieces. And when I was done with the treatment, it was a gorgeous fang that even um, someone from La Brea that came to our collection was looking at it and taking so many photos because it's so big in comparison uh, to the ones that, uh, that they have. And they have thousands. <laughs> so I was so proud that, you know, um, ours was was causing so much so much love um and the weirdest is also tied to the same pleistocene megafauna situation ground slots are weird they are just so strange so the funny thing is when i was learning a lot of my anatomy of fossils i was learning it with sloths and so now i look at a deer and i'm like what's wrong with this deer why are its bones so strange or this horse like why do they have bones like that? And it's actually the opposite to the sloths. They're just so weird, um, but they're just so cool at the same time. I love for those coolest kind of one at, <laughs> For coolest one at the Yelp, I'll put in a plug for Baby Joe, our little mascot, yeah. the baby Paris or all of this represent. <laughs> He's the cutest. <laughs> I will say really quick, the first time I ever experienced pyrite disease, I might have overreacted a bit because I was like, oh no, this is going to kill the whole collection. I need to take care of this right away. So it was like one ammonite shell, I think, like maybe like that big around. So I took it out of the collection. I put it in a plastic bag. I double bagged it. I put it in a box. I put it in its own cabinet and quarantined it. I think I overreacted because I was like, okay. Now it's not going anywhere and it's just there. I could have done this a little bit, but it was my first time. I was new to collections and I was like, I just don't want this to spread anywhere. And I was really scared. <laughs> well, but it's true. It does spread um, because it's a positive feedback. And so once it starts, you can't stop it. So even though it was maybe overreaction, that was good because that was a good instinct to just run away with that. <laughs> just keep it away until we can find a solution. Speaking of like, sometimes wanting to run away <laughs> as collections folks we get mysteries all the time or you know we find tags that are not associated with their specimens uh we find misidentified specimens and things like that um what is like how do you go about solving that do you just become an an investigator all of a sudden trying to piece these puzzles using whatever evidence you can get Yes. <laughs> you just, uh, yeah, you just become a detective. There's the curse on the industry is old white men forever ago going out and just collecting things without writing it down or getting permission. And then they bring it back to our museums and then it sits in a cabinet for 50 more years and people forget who even got it in the first place and there's nothing associated with it. And I don't think there's a collection in America or probably anywhere that's exempt from a little bit of that. Um, so yeah, a lot of like detective work 
is involved. A lot of like learning institutional knowledge, learning who was there before, where they went. It may some of them are lucky enough to have field notes or diaries or photos you can take. Um, we have a lot of our fossils collected a long time ago with basically no um, um, notes or anything associated with them, but we do have occasional photographs that are um, from that time period of like the student holding like a thing like this, and that can be the only clue we have about where it might have come from. And it's just keeping track of all those things and finding those things. And so you have to not only have your collections in order, but all of your paperwork in order. So like every bit of evidence ever generated by anyone who ever dug at your museum <laughs> is also part of the. The, the gambit, I guess. <laughs> Lindsay, I think you're still on mute. I am still muted. I am there so sorry. <laughs> I, I, was say, I, I think Bailey makes a really good point. A big part of the job is, um, you know, documenting your collections. And then if a collection doesn't already have documentation, working with your registrar's office to figure out how to do that. Um, and I feel like <laughs> there, like every situation is almost different. It's like really hard to come up with like a cookie cutter answer that'll fit all the collections because for example, our collection has been around since 1913, which is actually relatively young compared to some, and even in a hundred years, the kinds of mysteries and things that have come in are just like, well, I don't know. They've taught me the importance of doing it right the first time. <laughs> so moving forward, the people who get this job after me aren't pulling her out. Jen, I would yeah. just, I would just want to add that it's okay to also have an unsolved mysteries list. I have kind of a running list of, you know, I tried to solve this mystery and a piece was just still missing. So I have a note that if I find that piece, I'll refer back to my note. So keeping track of the things that you attempt to do, but maybe fail at because of some circumstances, um, it's good to have that record too, so that whoever picks it up later, or if you, you know, get word of a relative of someone that has the same last name, and you're like, oh my gosh, I have this fossil that maybe is someone of that you're related to, you can come back to it and have have the information ready to go. And I think it's also important in, in those lines. It's just you're always going to be that kind of detective person. That's just how it goes. Um, once I was doing a condition report on an object that someone had opened a cabinet and it was just there and they were like, what is this and why do we have it? It wasn't paleo, but it was this giant punch bowl um, made of a ginormous didacna shell that had all these silver mermaids and fish. And it was just amazing. And... They, they just opened the cabinet <laughs> like, what is this doing here? And so we started doing a lot of research in the collection, um, finding the story of why it was an invertebrate zoology, but before it had been an anthropology, but then it was a gift from then President Taft to the Smithsonian. It was this just crazy story. And I ended up finding a photo of the people that made it in the Philippines. It was just this crazy thing. And so sometimes these um, research questions you know of what is this they take you on these amazing rabbit holes so it's not just about you know solving the issue but it's also about oh my gosh the history that we have in this collection is so amazing and it's it's just so beautiful to be able to to be part of that oh yeah Sounds we like get some great stories <laughs> <laughs> or curse objects, objects and great stories <laughs> I mean, when we're, you know, a lot of times that institutional knowledge is so essential and the stories that you hear out of like, when you open a cabinet and you're just like, I don't know why this is here. And you go ask someone you're like, oh, that's great. And you sit down and you get like this whole 15 minute long history that you're just like, that was amazing. I still want to know why this is here. <laughs> but anyway, that's one of the best part about collections is you get to hear some really crazy th stories about like how people collected, like at the ALF Museum, Ray ALF, you know, would take his students to collect these huge track slabs. And you're like, how do you get them? And he's like, well, we had 15 high school boys ready to pull these track slabs up a mountain on woods on wood. And we're like, all right, cool. I'm glad you did that, had that because I'm not doing that ever again. <laughs> all right. Here's another question from Philip. Um, what is your advice on collection software? 
Seems like every museum I volunteered at uses something different. We use specify, go specify, consortium. I like saying consortium. Um, but yeah, what is all your opinions on, um, or advice on learning collection software? I would say, well, in a very general sense, whenever you can go with something open source. <laughs> and then secondarily, really the hands-on experience is really what helps. But there are a lot of communities out there that have solved probably the problem that you're trying to solve. So for example, we use EMU at the Naturalist Museum here, and there are a lot of other paleo collections that also use EMU. So I often try to crowdsource like answers to my question by asking other EMU users. And I know that other um, collection management software, collection management systems have like communities of individuals and not just in paleo, but in other disciplines that, um, you know, if it's be it Specify or Arctos or something else, um, you, you're not alone. I'll put it that way. Even if you don't have, you know, a database specialist on your staff, which is more common at large institutions. But if you're at a small museum, it's probably just going to be you. So definitely think broadly when you're trying to problem solve. And I want to say, I want to make another plug here for Spinach, which is the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. Um, they have a listserv, the NH call. And if you ask a question, you're always going to find someone who has had the problem that you have and, you know, already solved it or, you know, ask someone else, well, ask someone else, and it goes back to, you know, whatever. Um, but it's a great community. The natural history community is amazing. And actually doing a bunch of internships with a bunch of different uh, databases is the way to go because you learn what's good from one and what's bad in the other and you know how to deal with, with each one of them when, when you learn them. So good for you, Philip. And about databases, too, um, oftentimes it's sort of out of your hands. Like whatever your particular institution can afford is kind of what you're going to get because there is different price tags associated with each database, for better or worse. Um, the best ones aren't necessarily the most expensive ones, but the cheapest ones aren't necessarily the best or the worst either, just depending on your collection and what your goals are. So, yeah, the more, the wider variety that you have experience with, the better but also um, like training is available if you end up somewhere and you're like, I've never used this database. Like it's really not a deal breaker. Like so long as you know how to do data and take good notes and not leave out information and keep tags with specimens, you'll be fine. So. Keep your tags with your specimens. Yeah. <laughs> Please. This is, this is a plea. To just yes. make sure you do that. I was talking earlier about agents of deterioration and dissociation is one of them. And it's one of the scariest ones because if you don't have information, then you just have an old piece of rock. <laughs> it's true. Help, help us and keep your tags. <laughs> <laughs> future really students, you're going to go do research. Yeah. Future students, you're going to do a research visit. You got your tag. Stay on the specimen. Never move it. Just, just, just leave it. If you, you feel like you need to pick it up, no, no, put it back. It's fine. <laughs> Jen, how about you for database stuff? Uh, we also use Specify. Um, I've used Specify at a couple of institutions. I can't say it's the best for paleo collections, but there are certainly worse options. But I agree with everything that's been said. It's really a, knowing what you have to work with and, and figuring out kind of how to troubleshoot and I'm a huge proponent of NH call as well, like asking questions, like somebody has come across whatever problem you're having, probably in a similar setup. Awesome. Well, that brings us pretty much almost to the end of our panel. So one last question I'm going to ask everyone. This is very a serious question. How do you deal with curators? I'm just kidding. That's that's not. <laughs> Sorry. Andy's watching right now. I was just joking. I was joking. Um, the final question is actually a question from our amazing curator, Dr. Andy Farkey. Um, and I guess we'll each go around and end it with this is what advice would you have for students who have struggled academically, who would want to enter museum paleontology? I think wow. one thing that's already been said is grades are not everything. Um, it doesn't mean that you can just do whatever and not learn a thing, because I think the most important thing is the learning and not the grade. So if you talk to people and you have conversations, that is sometimes much more meaningful than whatever grade you had. 
Yeah, I would 100% um, agree with that. And I think in my own life, the biggest, um, a, the, the best uh, thing I gave myself to help myself was my own stubbornness, <laughs> which I think is a good thing to be like, uh, to, to convince yourself to be determined to become involved and to recognize your shortcomings and to address them and to work and to take feedback and to, um, like, like, uh, we've all talked about, it's not, there's no perfect way to do it. And there's no one person who's done it the perfect way. And so you should not hold yourself to that same standard and you should, uh, like pursue what you want, but don't give up, try your best, get, take feedback, make friends, have a good time and take care of yourself. Uh, I think uh, something that's really helped me is networking. So um, a deficiency, I guess, that I had was I, I didn't spend a lot of time in museums until I was in my PhD program. And I volunteered something like 500 hours at our local natural history museum, leading tour groups for all sorts of different age groups, just to work on my, you know, science communication skills, like Gabe was suggesting. Um, and then sticking like to your intuition, like once you kind of figure out what you want to do, um, making sure you you carve your own kind of path towards that and growing your network and building it. Um, it's, it's awkward kind of meeting new people, but I think the people that I've met, like I met Gabe online, like we were online friends and then we met in person and it was really excellent. And meeting up with these people in, in physical spaces or virtual spaces is, is really important and it helps your confidence. You meet their friends, they introduce you to new people, and then your network just kind of grows and grows. And the first time I went to a, a spinach meeting, um, it, I had so much fun. I had never felt so comfortable at a meeting. And then, you know, you're like, okay, these are my people. If I can go ahead and sit down at a table and start up a conversation with someone I had, had no introduction to, uh, but feel really comfortable and at ease in, in the situation. And I think that that's something that everyone should kind of look for and, and, and navigate and, and trust your gut on. Lindsay? I definitely agree with the networking comments. Um, I mean, all the comments are great, but um, I think that's just such a huge part of it. And if you're not really sure where to start, I think to kind of repeat what Jen was saying, volunteering is a really like low stress way to get your foot in the door and just see like what parts of the collection or if you know collections work is even something you decide you do like because there are definitely people who come in and they're like I want to do this and then they start and they're like I don't want to do this <laughs> anymore so that's like a really like low risk easy way to kind of get started with it but then if you do decide that this is something that you want to do I would say start looking for internships and make sure you take paid ones people should always pay you for your work in this field um, and kind of get started with that. Um, but like, if you're just trying to figure it out, like the volunteering stuff is a really great, um, way and we're always looking for help. So <laughs> you'll probably be able to find someone who needs your assistance. Awesome. Those are all great advice. And thank you all so much for taking your time to sit down with us and tell us about your stories and offer advice. This is, in my unbiased opinion, the best panel because collections managers are the best. So, you know, I think we could just end the event here today. You know, you can turn in for the preparator one, but really, I think everyone just wants to be a prepare, uh, collections manager now, right? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, like I said, thank you all so much for joining us today on um, our Path of the Collections. Tune in at four if you want to for our Path of the Preparator. Learn how to make rocks a part of your everyday life, and um, it'll be really fun. Uh, and as always, so make sure you like and subscribe to our channel for all the really cool stories from the world of paleontology. Thank you all so much, and we will see you at four o'clock. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.